So, chapter 10, the internet is not a little black box with a red beeping light on top of it. It does have weight, I suppose. Outline, how the internet works. So we'll talk a little bit about the architecture of the internet. Uh, connecting to an ISP, how we go about doing that. And not just for us as individuals, but really how the ISPs connect to the internet as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about internet access technologies and talk about DSL and cable modems. Distinguish between the two. They're fairly similar, but there's there's some subtle differences. Um, and we'll talk about what some of the issues are as far as the arguments between cable advocates versus DSL advocates. There's pros and cons to both. Uh, fixed and mobile wireless and then future technologies. We'll talk about internet government governance. There's this idea that somebody runs the internet or the somebody elders. owns who? The elders. The internet elders, <laughs> yes, run the internet and own it. Um, there's, I suppose, are some internet elders, but uh, not quite in the same sense. It's not an oracle that you go to and bow down to or anything like that. Uh, we'll talk about internet too, and then it finishes up talking about implications for management. So the internet, most most used network in the world, obviously. It, it, as big as it is, as much as we rely on it, we throw corporate networks on there. Uh, we've got various universities on there, and their research institutions. All these various various groups are connected to it, so obviously it's, it's the largest network in the world. By definition, an internet with a lowercase i is nothing more than a network of networks. That's, that's what an internet is. With a capital I, that refers to the internet that we connect to all the time, that we're familiar with, that we think of. But there are other internets, internets that are out there that exist. So when you see internet with a little bit lowercase i, it's usually referring to some type of a private intranet, or inter internet, I should say. Uh, so there's a distinction, lowercase i versus uppercase i. Uh, made up of thousands of networks of national state government agencies, nonprofit organizations, for-profit companies, uh, lots and lots and lots of different uh, groups that, that end up connecting to the internet. Uh, originally, control, originally controlled club, yes and no. Yes, it's rigidly controlled in the sense that different organizations have to adhere to a certain set of protocols, TCP, IP, for example, to be able to share information. But at the same time, there's not a lot of control about the content that you put up there. Uh, you can put up almost anything, and that's either good or bad, depending on your perspective. Um, let's see, unrestricted applications and contents. You, you know, If you've got the inspiration, you've got the money, you've got the time, you can develop virtually anything that will run across across the Internet. Hier there's a very hierarchical structure to the Internet, and we'll talk about that over the next few slides. Uh, as far as at, at the top level, we've got national ISPs, National Internet Service Providers. And these are really kind of the very, there's very few of these that really kind of filter down into to regional ISPs, local ISPs, and then ultimately us as individuals that connect. So we've got our national ISPs. At a lower level, we end up with a lot more regional ISPs, and then lots and lots and lots of local ISPs. Um, access points connect national ISPs together. Sometimes large regional and local ISPs also have direct access to, to, uh, to the uh, network access points. There's also, if you happen to have a large uh, um, metropolitan area, say the Washington, D.C. area, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, so very large uh, metropolitan areas, you might end up with what's referred to as a metropolitan area exchange, which is kind of a, a gateway between your uh, your network access points and your local internet uh, uh, local internet carriers. So if you were to graph it out, you might see something like this. You end up with very few national ISPs. Then regionally, you end up with regional ISPs, and then in metropolitan areas. Large, large metropolitan areas, you end up with MAEs. Then you end up with your regional ISPs, companies like the FlashNet that used to exist in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. In a lot of cases, those regional, or excuse me, those local ISPs have been bought up over the years by larger ISPs. Uh, so you don't see a lot of local ISPs uh, in, in, especially in larger metropolitan areas anymore. They tend to be owned by major metropolitan, or by uh, uh, MAEs anymore. Here, for example, you do still tend to see some local ISPs. A cable company, for example, is a, 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 what would be considered a local ISP. Now, how do those different ISPs take data from this ISP 
over to this ISP or this regional ISP share information with this regional ISP? Well, they're sending data across their networks, right? Well, when we send data across the network, we've got to pay our ISP to be able to do that, right? Well, they've kind of reached an agreement where they don't charge each other for that because they realize that if we're sending data, we're going to be receiving data as well. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to keep track of every little bit that goes back and forth. So through an agreement known as peering, they simply choose not to charge those that are at the same level. Now, they have to pay for access to a higher level, they charge ISPs that are at a lower level, or an ISP charges us as, at a different level. So vertically, there are charges, but from a, a horizontal perspective, they don't charge. The ISPs don't charge each other. So it's a process referred to as peering. Connecting to an ISP done through an ISP point of presence, a physical location that they have that you're connecting to. In a lot of cases, if it's dial-up, you're dialing into that point of presence. Or if it's cable or DSL, it goes back to a central office of some sort where they, they uh, coordinate their access to a higher level ISP. Corporate users are going to connect via T1s, T3s, etc. It's a little bit different than, than the way we, we would connect. So inside a point of presence, you've got the various individual users that might try to connect. Individual users, be it dial-up or DSL. As well as corporate users, they all come back to that point of presence, where that point of presence has point of presence has to ha have has to have the various equipment to be able to handle all those different connections. Potentially an ATM switch, T3, T1, DSL, modems, etc. And then they have connections back upstream to connect themselves to higher level ISPs. That higher level ISP might look something like this. So if we go back here, what this is doing, this switch is connecting back to the Chicago ISP. So if this is Chicago here, this is what Chicago sees. They have a main switch uh, and a router to go back up to a higher level ISP. And they're able to connect with these smaller individual regional ISPs. Does that make sense? So there's a very hierarchical structure to all this. Make sense? come back just a little bit. So if, the, if we have an individual user that's connected to somebody on this local ISP, it's going to go back up to this regional ISP, assuming, it, assuming we're trying to send, say, something over here. It's going to go to this regional ISP. This regional ISP is going to go to this MAE. This MAE may have to then go back through, depending on the, the particular how the routers are configured. It could either go this way, or than likely it would go something like this something like that, to be able to traverse its way across the internet. Now, when I say something like that, it's not necessarily well defined. Why? Because circuits get busy. Routers have to make decisions and say, this particular circuit going this way is too tied up. So we're going to take a different route. Those are the decisions that routers have to make. Okay. Internet backbones. Backbone circuits for national ISPs really have to be very large. For the most part, we've been talking in, in the you know up to about 10 gig gigabit Ethernet uh, and 10 gig Ethernet. These at, at this level, they have to operate at those speeds and faster. Why? Because they're handling a tremendous amount of data. Think about all those various users that are connected just down here to a single local ISP. All that traffic has to travel back up, so this circuit right here gets really busy. But at the same time, you've got this circuit that's really busy, this circuit that's really busy. That means this circuit is really busy. So now these circuits have to, you have to end up uh, at, at these levels as you're moving back up here. You have to start having multiple circuits. They have to be very high-speed circuits. So as a result, you end up with potential for congestion back here at the regional ISPs even more potential for congestion, more potential for congestion. Okay. Um, part of the reason for poor congestion is this idea of, of aggregating internet traffic. Again, at the, at, at you as an individual don't consume that much bandwidth. Even if you're sending video files, I mean, is that a lot of data? Yes. But relatively speaking to the, the amount of, of data that uh, an ISP is processing, that's not a lot of data. 
it's when you combine all those users together and then all the users from various ISPs and different types of data that this idea of aggregating all that data together, it becomes a real issue because it's growing very quickly. We are, every time we get a little bit more bandwidth, we develop applications to consume that bandwidth. A few years ago, you would never consider downloading a movie. Now it gets done all the time. I was looking up a, a statistic the other day about uh, uh, Netflix, and depending on how accurate that particular article was, said that Netflix consumes approximately 22% of the North American bandwidth. That's one company. One company. Now, it's video, so it makes sense that it would consume a lot. But 22%? That's huge. Wouldn't YouTube be larger than that? No. YouTube's less. Wow. Because they're short videos. They tend to be short videos, and uh, in a lot of cases, those videos are not particularly good quality. They're, they're the the uh, resolution of those is not necessarily that high. They do take um, uh, they do have the capability of, of producing HD video, but most of the videos that YouTube has are not HD. So but so so is Netflix, right? Like they the, do like though their videos are HD, but you don't get the connect if the connection is not good enough, they uh, lower it down to 480p. So right. But I would think like YouTube will have more users than Netflix because it's paid and YouTube is free, so somebody's on it all the time. Yeah, a lot. Even for listening songs, I'll tell you right now, like using YouTube. Now. I do not have cable TV at home. All I have is internet access, and I watch a lot of Netflix. That's where I found that video. Oh, okay. Now that video was on YouTube. That clip was. Yeah. But that's where I found that series. I watched the whole series uh, on, on Netflix because they've got it. I watch a lot of Netflix. So they're consuming an awful lot, and it's only going to get, I don't want to say get worse, but it's only going to continue to increase because as we add bandwidth, we develop applications, we develop uses for consuming that bandwidth. We like to be able to carry our phones around with it. My phone now has a Netflix app on it. Do I really need to be driving watching Netflix? <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe but... Um, well, maybe, but then I'd use my computer. Um, expected to reach 80 terabits per second uh, by 2011. I don't know. I tried looking up that stat. I didn't find anything on it. I didn't spend a lot of time looking for it. Uh, but, man, 80 terabits. I, I don't even know how much that is. It's, it's huge. Um, NAPs and MAEs are becoming bottlenecks, requiring larger and larger switches. There's a physical constraint there as well. I mean, go back and think about... Think about the building here. Think about the physical building. To be able to continue to grow with the demand for access, it requires not only speed, but also the, the, an increase in the number of circuits. Well, you get to a point where you're physically adding circuits. The more circuits you physically add, eventually you get to the point where physically you have to have a larger building, a bigger building more space to house all these circuits coming into one place. So it becomes an issue in these very, in these very, uh, uh, in these centralized points where you have all these circuits coming into one place. Again, at a, at a local ISP level, it's not necessarily a, a big deal. They have fewer circuits. But where you have these areas where they're all coming together in one place, it is becoming, starting to become a big deal. Um, so Sprint's internet backbone might look something like that. <clears throat> uh, and probably a, a few years old at this point. So internet access technologies. This is really more where, where as consumers, we might, might be working. A few years ago, you probably used dial-up, 56K, fun stuff. You got to hear the nice little tones. If you were smart, you had an external modem because you could turn it off and turn it back on. Um, certainly had certain advantages. It was more secure. Um, it was cheap. And it was secure. Uh, those are the three advantages. Um, but it was really painfully slow, so obviously we don't, we don't like that. Most others are commonly called broadband access. That's not necessarily the correct term. They're not necessarily all broadband. But broadband has really kind of become a term that refers to anything that's high speed. High speed is defined as pretty much anything that's faster than dial-up. So whether it's broadband or not, we tend to refer to, to these other uh, technologies as broadband. Common ones are DSL, cable modems, fixed wireless, and, and mobile wireless. 
So DSL is a family of point-to-point -point technologies. It's they say family because there's multiple flavors, if you will, of DSL. So just because you hear DSL doesn't necessarily mean it's the same as another company's DSL. There's different flavors, if you, if you will. Um, designed to provide high-speed data transmissions over traditional telephone lines. Um, traditional telephone lines, it does have limited capacity due to telephone and switching equipment at the end office. And it's constrained by a 4 kilohertz voice signal. We're sharing a DSL line over traditional uh, telephone lines in addition to our voice calls that are still going across that same line. So we're not using the entire capacity of that line for our data. Part of that line is being reserved for voice communications. But it does allow significantly faster communications than we were getting via dial-up. Um, DSL is not available everywhere because there's some technological constraints in terms of the distance that the DSL symptom can be broadcast in terms of the telephone equipment. So your DSL connected uh, uh, facilities have to be within a certain range in order to be able to get service. The further out you get, the slower the service that you're going to receive. So DSL might look something like that. Your local loop here between the, the uh, CO and your premises, your house, your, your business, for example, comes in. In most cases, it's going to have some kind of a splitter, something that separates the voice signals from the, the data signals. Uh, and, and so you're going to have something that basically acts as a filter to be able to filter that out so that you don't hear those data signals on your telephone line. Some of the common types, there's ADSL, VDSL. There's a number of different types. There's another flavor that's referred to as G-Lite, which really has nothing to do with any kind of a standard as... Uh, it has more to do really, with really more to do with marketing. Uh, kind of like what um, Intel did here several years ago. They, they changed the name of their processors from the 486, 386, 486, et cetera, that referred to the architecture, which couldn't be trademarked, to pit the Pentium class. They did that because they could trademark Pentium. They couldn't trademark the architecture of it. So uh, something similar in the DSL world. Come up with something like DSL, or uh, excuse me, something like G Lite, you can market that if you say DSL that, as it refers to the architecture, and it's not something that can really be marketed that much. Uh, so ADSL, uh, you end up with basically three channels. One's for voice, one's for upstream, one's for downstream. The A in ADSL refers to a, uh, asymmetrical. Asymmetrical, when they talk about that, they mean different versus symmetrical and the same. Asymmetrical, referring to the upstream and downstream uh, speeds not being the same. And that's appropriate for most people because for the most part we tend to download a lot more than we upload. When we send a web request to a web page, for example, we type in the, the web address of http www.microsoft.com. That's a very small request. The size of that request is very small. The page that we download is much larger because we're downloading pictures, images, uh, various text and things like that. So it, it, it's appropriate that we tend to want a faster download speed than we do an upload speed. Another flavor, uh, VDSL, very high data rate uh, DSL, designed for local loops of 4,500 feet or less. So you have to be much closer to the CO to be able to receive that, that speed. So the distance, it, it, it's very sensitive with respect to distance. But you can see when you get closer, your speeds are much better, 12 meg down versus and 1.6 up versus up here where we end up with about one and a half down and 384 kilobits per second down. So significantly faster. So then there's your G light and they give you some, some examples, some comparisons of the performance of different types of DSL. For the most part, I'm not that concerned about you knowing the different types. I do want you to, to kind of understand DSL versus cable, but you don't need to know the specific speeds or anything like that. And then VDSL rates. Now, cable modems, in some ways, are very similar, but yeah, question? Uh, we don't need, uh, for the users, we don't need a higher upload speed uh, than the download speed. But what about the servers, the sites are uh, stored at? What do they use? Like, because they need more upload speed, right? It, it'll be the other way around. 
back and explain that again. Say that again. Like uh, you, when you said. Uh, yeah, as consumers, that's correct. Yeah, like, uh, but if it's if it's Microsoft Server to give the site to us, they they are sending everything like images, text, and uh, uh, data, like structure of how it's gonna form. So, how what do they use to have other way around? Like they need less download speed rather than the upload. Speed. Yeah, they're they're not. They're much more likely to have something either symmetrical or, yeah, maybe a faster connection down or for them up than down. Um, it really depends on the, the particular business and, and how they want to do it, what, what they want to do, what their requirements are. Yes, you're, you're correct. Companies like eBay, YouTube, they need very fast upload speeds because from the consumer's perspective, they're downloading. Uh, from their perspective, they're uploading and they need very fast uh, upload speeds. But that's a, that's something that's that is dependent on the business because not every company needs that. Uh, a lot of companies are, for example, not necessarily doing e-commerce. They're simply out on the web providing a a, a portal and essentially an image, uh, allowing customers to identify who they are and identify ways to contact them. But they're not really providing any really rich content that requires a lot of uh, uh, upload speed from their perspective. So it really depends on the businesses to what types of circuits that they want to provide to be able to account for high-speed upload. So it, it depends. Uh, cable modems. Uh, digital service offered by cable television. There's not really a standard when it comes to the te uh, cable tele uh, television industry as far as, as internet access, but kind of an unofficial standard is, is Indoxus, and that's a, it refers to the protocol that, that cable modems use to communicate back with the, their, their version of the CO uh, at the cable company. That allows the, the cable box to be able to communicate back with them. Um, as far as the, the quality of it really depends. Um, theoretically, you can get some really, really good service from cable. So you end up with a lot of people that are very, <coughs> very loyal to uh, cable uh, um, internet service because you do oftentimes get some very good download speeds. Something that's a little bit different, let's see if they come down here. One of the things you should notice, let's, let's look at this and we'll go back to DSL here in just a second. I'm not worried about you understanding any of this. and I'm not, This is really something we've kind of worked on, so you should have a fairly good idea of what's going on there. What I want you to look at is this right here, what's going on. You've got the cable company that's right over here. Look at this line right here. That's connected to this house. That line is connected this house and to this house. That is the equivalent in a local area network to shared Ethernet. Basically meaning that if this one happens to have a network card on it that can be set to promiscuous mode, that, promiscuous mode, that means it can listen to all the data that this house is transmitting and all the data that this house is transmitting because it's a shared line. So there's a security concern when it comes to cable, and that's a legitimate complaint from DSL users. Um, that's not the one you tend to hear, but that is a legitimate complaint. Let's go back to DSL. DSL, each line goes directly over to the telephone company. So you don't have that issue. Now what oftentimes you end up hearing from the, the actual argument being from DSL customers or from DSL companies is that because of this shared line, as more and more customer premises are using your cable access, you're all sharing that bandwidth of that line so your performance goes down. That's true, but the reality is the same exact thing happens in DSL. It just happens back here rather than out here. So as far as performance, there's not much of a difference in terms of, of the hit that you take with, with uh, uh, more and more people getting online. My bigger concern would really be more about the security side of things. Now having said that, it, as long as you, you keep your system patched and updated and the, the banks that you go to use HTTPS uh, for, for encryption, you're fine. You're not gonna, you don't have to worry about anything. But at the same time, you do want to be careful with respect to some things. You do not want to send email, for example, with uh, pass usernames and passwords in it. You do not want to send email with uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers.
because email is broadcast in, in, in plain text. So anybody that happened to be listening in in a, a, a cable environment would see those, and, and again, having their, their card set to promiscuous mode, they could listen to all those bits as they're going across the wire, and they'd have access to all of that. So there is that, that issue with respect to, to cable modems. <coughs> Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Cable modem architecture similar to DSL with one main difference. DSL is a point-to-point -point technology. Cable modems use shared multi-point circuits. That's what I was just talking about a second ago. They share that circuit together. So all of those, that? all of those on that drop are on the same drop. So it's a shared circuit. Um, the more people there are on the circuit, the slower the service is going to be. Uh, let's see, they talk about some of this other stuff I'm not worried about. Okay. So does that make sense? DSL versus cable? Which one's better? Which one's cheap? Keep your system patched. Uh, fixed wireless. Two most important types, WiMAX and, and, and wireless DSL. And then we've got satellite, which is becoming more affordable. We'll get to, back to that here in just a second. Uh, WiMAX, we've talked about before. Um, it, it's essentially a, a wireless LAN, uh, but on a larger scale. So it might serve a, a geographic region, say, uh, Grand Prairie, something like Grand Prairie has, has in place. Uh, wireless DSL requires line of sight access between transmitters, meaning you can't have buildings in the way, you can't have trees in the way. So you usually have to have tall buildings or a tower that's going to be able to connect the two. Uh, as far as satellites, satellite, this is showing the, the date of the book just a little bit. Satellite communications are great when you happen to be too far outside of town. You don't have cable access. You're too far away for DSL. You may not have a choice but to go with satellite if you want something faster than dial-up. Um, satellite has come, come a long way over the last few years. Originally, to be able to get internet service across satellite, you had to down, you downloaded your data from via a satellite dish. Then your telephone line was used to upload your request. So when you typed in a web page, your, you still had a modem that would send the request across the telephone line, and then you download what you were supposed to receive via your satellite. And that added a little bit of a delay. And again, you're communicating with a satellite, which is thousands of miles above, uh, uh, above us. So you end up with a little bit of built-in latency just because of that. But having said that, that's a very old approach. Uh, newer systems, you're able to upload and download your requests and your, your data that you're downloading. So uh, you can go up and back without necessarily using a telephone line on newer satellite systems. As far as fixed wireless, there's two different types, point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint. Point-to-point is appropriate when we, say, have a building and we don't, have to, we don't want to have to lay a wire. Uh, say we're in the middle of New York City. We can't really dig up the road efficiently and effectively. Maybe we want to connect two different buildings wirelessly via some type of a, 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 a fixed wireless uh, um, system. And the, the idea is that we connect those two buildings via, uh, via a fixed wireless uh, approach. And then within that individual building, we can then run wires or run a wireless access point to allow access within that building. With multipoint, it allows access by a limited number of stations. It's designed as an alternative to DSL and cable modems. That's where on one end, our transmitting end, or I guess it's transmitting and receiving, but our main end that, that's providing services, it broadcasts this signal out to everybody. Everybody that's within, that, within range has the potential then to pick up that signal. It's kind of like television service. Everybody has the potential as long as you're within range and an antenna and a, a, a television that you can tune to the appropriate channel, you tune to the appropriate channel, you can pick up channel 4, channel 5, channel 8, etc. It's the same concept with a point to multipoint. That's exactly what's going on. It's, it's, with the TV, it's being, it's being broadcast from a, a single point. Their broadcast station is being received by everybody that's out in the field. You have to have that tuner that tunes to the right station. When it comes to computers, it's the same thing. You have to have the appropriate credentials to be able to log in, username, password, any encryption keys, etc. cetera. Uh, data access speeds are going to range on the low end from about 1.5 to 54 megabits and, and something like that. It's really going to depend on a variety of 
factors, the weather, how far you are, how many structures might be between you and the transmitting tower. So there's a lot of factors that can affect, affect your speed. Uh, mobile wireless allows users to access the internet from any location. The real major challenge is bandwidth. I mean, I, I know they talk about blazing 3G and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's not blazing. It's, it's better than what you used to have, but you know, it's not, it's not exactly broadband. Um, but they are making progress, and it's something that will continue to get better and better uh, to the point to, that uh, you probably see even with the proliferation of wireless networks that we've already seen, you'll continue to see that become even, uh, even more widespread. Current mobile wireless technologies, slow access speeds compared to DSL cable model, we just got through talking about. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Wireless lands high, high speed but limited range. That's the real advantage to something like 3G because you don't have the same range limitations. Well, that's not to say you can't get out to certain places in West Texas and drop signals because you can, uh, but for the most part, we really have pretty good coverage. Um, one way to try to address some of these issues is through what's referred to as wireless application protocol. It's the idea that a web page is not necessarily designed for every device that might be consuming it. Think about a computer or a laptop. We tend to have somewhat standard displays, right? They're approximately the same size. They're approximately the same dimensions. So when you go from one computer to the next, any differences in the web page, for the most part, aren't too big. We can usually deal with that. When we access them from a smartphone, though, now all of a sudden our display screen is much smaller. We don't usually have a keyboard and a mouse and big speakers and all these things to be able to interact with that page. So we have to have some way of modifying that page easily to be able to interact with it with different types of devices. And that's what the, the idea behind wireless application protocol is about, is being able to facilitate making that transaction, or that transition from a traditional web page to something that's more easily understood by different display devices. The idea, in addition to making it easier to access, is if we get rid of a lot of the extra crud that we can download on a, on a, on a, a machine that's connected to a high-speed network, get rid of a lot of that so that on a slower connected uh, device, now all of a sudden we're saving some of that bandwidth. So it doesn't, even though our speeds are slower on a smartphone, we still have fairly good response because we're not downloading all those extra images, those high resolution images, for example. Uh, we don't necessarily have to download all that to uh, obtain the functionality of that website. Um, and they kind of go through this whole process. If you've got a client over here, say a smartphone, that, that goes to access, your, your uh, a particular website, it types in the web address for that particular website, what's going to happen is that signal comes into the website and the website does an evaluation or the, the, the site that the website is being hosted at does an evaluation to identify the type of request that's coming in. Is that a request that's coming in from a standard desktop computer with a, a display of, of a certain size? If so, then it can respond from the web server just like it would any other request it knows to respond with the appropriate web page. If, however, that request comes from a different type of device, a device that has a very small screen, it can, it can use all these various technologies to be able to modify that, that web page so that it's appropriately displayed on that particular device. Because I don't know about you, I have to have glasses. I can't. If you crammed a web page down so that you could squeeze it into my little smartphone, everything would be so small I couldn't read anything. And I certainly couldn't. Hit the, hit the links. So that's where the, the WAP architecture comes in into play is it identifies the type of device that's accessing the web page and then modifies the content so that it, it fits on a smaller device. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you might want to talk to, to Dr. Schultz. That's something that she's been interested in is developing uh, um, applications for for uh, web apps for smartphones and things like that. That's something she's she's kind of been curious about. Uh, future access technology, passive optical networking, also called, called fiber of the home. Um, it's becoming more and more prominent. Um, I don't know how much you see
see it around here. I know that in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, because of Verizon, for example, you saw a lot of fiber to the home. Um, Charter Communications was doing a, a, a fiber to the home. Verizon was doing fiber to the home. So there was a lot of, of, of uh, uh, expansion of that in, in some of the areas around here. Uh, it, it's really nice, the fiber to the home. You get some really good speeds. You end up with some really good services in addition to that. Uh, and it's just a, a really nice uh, um, way to access the Internet. Unfortunately, it's not available everywhere yet. And it's not cheap. It's not necessarily expensive, but it's, it's not really the cheapest access either. Uh, an alternative is Ethernet to the home. And again, the advantage to using Ethernet, because we use it at so many different levels of communications, it's always nice whenever you can reuse it. It's a very good protocol. It's something that's been, been uh, uh, used quite a bit. So instead of using point-to-point -point like we normally use for a lot of our communications, something like Ethernet to the home would allow us to eliminate yet another protocol and take advantage of a protocol that we already use at, at multiple levels. Um, okay, so who runs the internet? Well, I remember back in the, the mid-90s, you, you saw Microsoft came out with uh, Windows 95. And you really saw the internet explode because Windows 95 was a very good operating system for the time. Uh, very user friendly, and so the PC world kind of everybody got on the internet. It was just very easy to do so. The graphical user interface really facilitated a lot of that, and so you saw tremendous growth occurring about that time. It's about the time the internet really started getting uh, some wind under its wings and, and started to take off. And at that time, my sister was an exchange student. She was uh, living in Germany, and everybody thought the internet came from uh, at least people that she was talking to thought that it came from Europe. Um, obviously people from the United States have a different opinion. The reality is, is it really did come from everywhere. Uh, the, the internet infrastructure, a lot of that did come from the U.S., but things like the web browser, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the, the, the web, that's European. I mean, so it, it, it's hard to say that any one person or any one group or any one country develop the internet. So there's not this one organization, there's not this one country that runs the internet. There's different groups, different companies, different countries that all work together to be able to facilitate that communication that, that goes back and forth. The idea is, is that there's supposed to be this open development and evolution of the internet for the benefit of all people. If you talk to Tim Berners-Lee, that's almost exactly what he will tell you. Uh, everybody knows who Tim Berners-Lee is. He's the guy that did not conceptualize the World Wide Web, but he did put it into practice. What's his name? Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee. It's like B-E-R-N-E-R-S hyphen L-E-E, -E, I believe. Um, he was, there, there were prior uh, visions, if you will, of uh, this idea of a hyperlink and what a hyperlink is and, and linking of documents from one document to another via hyperlinks. Um, going back into the 1940s. Uh, so the concept of hyperlinks has been around for quite some time. Tim Berners-Lee just applied that particular concept to the internet. Hence, we ended up with the web. That's the distinction between the internet and the web, just kind of FYI. The internet is the physical infrastructure that all these various technologies run on. The World Wide Web speci specifically refers to those linked pages that are, are all connected via hyperlinks. Um, but if we were going to say that there was, was an organization that ran the web, uh, which we probably shouldn't, but the Internet Society is probably the closest one to be able to make that claim. Um, public policy, uh, they're involved in a, a variety of areas, including public policy, education, and standards. These are areas that get hashed out all the time because... There's constant, the Internet's constantly evolving, so we have these issues to constantly go back and take a look at. A major component of the ISOC is the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, concerned with the evolution of the Internet architecture and smooth operation of the Internet. Uh, and they take comments from a variety of places about improvements, things that can be done, things that are wrong with the Internet. Um, that's probably the most important one, uh, more so than these other ones. 
uh, I, IESG, Internet Engineering Steering Group, responsible for management of standards, establishes and administers rules in creating standards, IAB, IRTF. But IETF is something that you'll hear fairly regularly if you're if you follow along these things. So that direction of the internet, where is it going? Well, one conceptualization that I say is a conceptualization, it's, it's coming to, to fruition, uh, is the internet too. It's essentially an instantiation of the internet going back to its roots. Um, originally the internet, after it evolved from the original ARPANET, was designed to facilitate collaboration between universities, research institutions, corporations that were doing the research, um, really in an effort to develop knowledge, in an effort to share science, uh, scientific exploration. That was the idea behind the, the very early workings of the Internet. Uh, and, and that's kind of what the vision of the Internet 2 was going back to. Well, obviously, if it's 2, it's got to be an improvement, right? Well, it, it is much, much, much faster. Uh, and, and able to, to perform at much higher speeds. We're not the only ones working on something like this. Um, Canada, for example, has their own version uh, uh, that they refer to as CANET. And there's kind of an example of some of the linkages to it. At this point, they don't allow a lot of people to connect to it. It's not part of the regular internet. So it's really only connecting certain universities, certain corporations, etc., that are doing uh, certain types of research. It helps to facilitate collaboration. Uh, features of the future internet: access via gigapops, instead, uh, similar to network access points. Simply a cha change in terminology. We'll be going to IP version six rather than IP version four. Why? Because we insist on hooking up coffee pots to the internet. We want to hook everything up to the internet. As a result, everything that connects to the internet has to have a unique IP. Well, when we hook up our coffee pots, now all of a sudden we're using one, two, three, four, five, and, it, and more addresses per person. Well, you can go through a lot of addresses that way, and that's exactly what we're doing. Think about at your house. You've probably got multiple computers that are connected to your network. If you've got a smartphone, that's connected. That's got an IP address. All those computers have IP addresses. You have a game system, it probably connects to the internet. It's got an IP address. So you're using multiple IP addresses at home. So as a result, we run out of addresses with IP version 4. So in the future, almost everything's going to be IP version 6. It's an evolutionary process, but that's where it's going. Uh, new protocol development focusing on issues like quality of service and multicasting. They both make sense. We have to have quality, of, the ability to handle quality of service because not all data is the same. Think about the, the data that we send via the email. Is it really important that a particular packet gets there a few seconds before a previous packet? Probably not. If you're talking, though, if you're sending video, it does make a difference that the syllables arrive in the order in which they're intended. If they arrive out of order, it sounds like pig Latin. You can't understand it. It just doesn't make sense. So quality of service becomes a bigger deal as we put more and more of those types of services online. Even though we're talking about increased speeds of the Internet to, uh, of the Internet and of the Internet to, a way to try to limit or more efficiently use our resources is through this concept of multicasting. The concept of multicasting is that th this idea of going back to that point to multi point communication that we were talking about wirelessly. It's the same concept, but it occurs across a wired connection. So, for example, it's probably easier to consider. Let's think about if I have a server and you all want to access a video off my server, if you all do it independently, that opens up a data stream for each individual computer that logs into the server, right? Does that make sense? That's for you. That's a lot of bandwidth because you're accessing one, one you know, a video. For me, that's a lot of bandwidth because I've got a data stream for each student. So it's huge on my end. Well, multicasting allows us to, to basically say it's one data stream for you and it's one data stream for me. It get, gets broadcast. Only the computers that are listening to that multicast 
are the ones that pick up that signal. So it's a way to conserve bandwidth uh, on, a, on a particular network. Uh, new applications with all this increased bandwidth and all this ability to control quality of service and things like that, things like tele-immersion and video conferencing, you want to probably go back and YouTube uh, some of these videos uh, and do a search for some of these videos. There's some Cisco videos that, that talk about some of this stuff uh, and show you some examples. There's one, for example, that shows uh, a, a conference room where you've got literally a table that's set up in front of screens and chairs. And on the screen, you see a display right across. It almost looks like a mirror. It's another set of tables that look just like the tables in, in your room, a set of chairs behind it that look just like the chairs in your room, except that it's a thousand miles away and allows you to sit down at a conference table and look at people across the table from you that are somewhere else. Tele-immersion, there's another example with John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, where he's giving a, a conference uh, presentation on tele-immersion, and he has one of his colleagues give the presentation with him. The only difference is, is his colleague is somewhere overseas, and he's been generated by a holographic image standing there next to him. So you have this holographic image standing there giving the presentation. It's a very interesting thing. A little short video, so see if you can't find that. Implications for management. Concern about traffic slowing down the internet. That was a concern. Companies like Netflix are going to bring down the internet. Well, they consume an awful lot of it. But the reality is, is we have a lot of corporations, Verizon, AT&T, MCI, Sprint, etc., that invest money in their telecommunication networks. They've been doing that for years. In fact, in a lot of cases, they have additional lines that simply aren't being used because they don't need them yet. Um, so they've gone through a, a rapid amount of expansion to be able to address a lot of these needs. At the same time, you've had certain technological uh, advances that have allowed them to get more output of those, those communication lines. Excuse me. So as a result, they're able to, ha have been able to thus far, be able to keep up with the increases in demands. So that really has not come to fruition. Uh, lots of uh, broadband technologies for high-speed uh, access. Simple to move large amount of data in most homes and businesses with, with rich multimedia uh, types. So we're finding ways to consume bandwidth. So even though we've been able to keep up, we're finding ways to consume it. So you know, it's not like there's a lot extra. Uh, which access technology to dominate? Uh, that's the $100,000 question. Uh, at, at this point, if I had to place a bet, I'd say Ethernet to the home, um, just because it makes sense. Although there's a lot of, uh, of uh, companies that are investing in fiber to the home that, you know, if you throw enough money behind it, it doesn't really matter what makes sense. It's, it's money talks. So uh, who knows which one's going to, going to dominate. So that's that chapter. I, I, was that one a little bit easier to... Oh, yes. Follow and understand. I thought it would be. I think. I think. I really think the remaining chapters will be, um, because they are closer to what most people see on a regular basis. Any questions over over the chapter?